Welcome to Wisła in Poland. We're here at the annual conference of the European Leadership Forum, which is a coalition of evangelical Christian groups seeking to do what no single organization could do alone, provide a bridge between God's global resources and local leaders from all over Europe. I'm joined by Emmanuel or Mano Campuris, retired chairman, CEO and president of American Standard Companies, Inc a leading global manufacturer operating in 34 countries. In 2000, together with his wife, Camille, I hope I pronounced that correctly, he founded the Kairos Journal, an online magazine which seeks to embolden, educate, equip, and support pastors and church leaders as they strive to transform the moral conscience of their culture and restore the prophetic voice of the church. In 2007, Mano founded Bible Mesh, an online course to help people learn the comprehensive story of scripture and apply to all aspects of life. Mano serves on the head of Amway, Inc, should I say Inc, <laughs> Incorporated. He also uh, has served on the boards of numerous blue chip companies and the National Endowment for Democracy, the Hudson Institute, the US Chamber of Commerce and the Eisenhower Exchange Fellowships. He is a member of the Economic Club of New York and the Oxford University Law Society. Thank you very much, Mano, for joining us here in the Delighted. studio. Delighted. It's a corner of a, a large hotel in Poland. But, Wonderful. Um, you have a very broad experience in uh, industry, but also in Christian leadership, and we're here to try and learn some lessons from your life. Um, do you want to start near the beginning and yes. exactly as you want to play it, right well, up, whether it's your professional career or your, or your uh, Christian experience? Well, my Christian experience is that I came to Christ at a late age. Um, my parents, uh, I was born in Egypt of European parents. My father was Orthodox, my mother was Anglican. So I ended up being sort of ecumenical, if you will, at home. I then was, uh, I went to England, school, and there, of course, this is the first time where I was exposed to the Bible, given the fact that we had religious teaching, mandatory at the time. Uh, subsequent to that, I went to university and then uh, ended up in the United States in business. Uh, and uh, my wife of 34, 31 years uh, was diagnosed with cancer at the time. And that sort of was a transformational period for me. It was a very, it was a devastating period because she passed away about two years later. And that certainly put a question in my life as to what I, was I doing, what was the purpose and the like. So that was a period, a difficult period for me. A friend of mine then uh, took me to church. And so I went back to church at that time. Um, then I, had the uh, I went to Greece for a memorial service for my wife. And during that trip, I was taken to Mount Athos. I don't know if you know Mount Athos is, but it's the northern part of Greece, about 20 monasteries. So I went up there in, a, in a, one of the monasteries, and I was very impressed by that because um, I found out it was a diff different world, completely different world. Um, you know, people just worked, prayed, and worshipped. That's all they did all day or the monks, and it was very impressive because they were totally detached from life as I knew it, you see. And I was also affected by the fact the way they prayed, you went to, we went to various uh, services at all times of the day. I mean, they started, some of them started at five in the morning, three in the morning, and depending, I um, wasn't quite sure how the timetable worked, but anyhow, did it in church, and I saw a lot of the monks prostate praying. So you really, I was very much affected by that, and that certainly opened my heart towards Christ. I began to realize there was another world out there which I had missed all these. And how long was that period over there? You mean um, how long? Uh, was yes, that? yes. Oh. There was a short period, yeah. only three days. Okay. But it was a powerful three days for me because it was, a, as I said, another world. And uh, then I went back to New York. I uh, went back to church. Uh, and then, in fact, so the next year I went back again. I was invited back again and went back to the monastery and spent another three days there. 
And when I returned after that to New York, I started uh, went to Bible study. I went to BSF, which is a Bible study fellowship, for eight years thereafter. When I returned to my to New York, I also met my wife, um, who's here with me uh, today, and uh, we got married and uh, we started our sort of ministry together, if you will, during that period. Wonderful, wonderful. And you, you have a prolific business career, but could you give us a, a sort of snapshot over well, here? Yes, the, uh, I started, uh, I went to university in Oxford, I went to Oxford uh, after school, and went back to Egypt, as my father was in the cotton business at the time. And indeed, uh, that was the main industry of Egypt. Uh, as I completed my apprenticeship after two and a half years, Nasser nationalized everything, so couldn't work anymore. So it was back to scratch after all this effort. And I was offered a job in a ceramic factory in Greece, so I decided to go back and get a degree in ceramic technology, which I did back. It was in Stoke-on-Trent, Polytechnic. And during that period, I met people uh, from American Standard who were trying to develop business, expand their business activity in Europe. Now, American Standard, as you mentioned, is a large, large multinational company. It started in Europe in 1898, so it had a long tradition. And indeed, I was, able to, uh, I was able to convince them to set up this factory, and I became its president. And then in a series of promotions, I ended up in the States in 1979, uh, heading the whole plumbing business worldwide by 84, and became its chief executive in 1989. So that is a snapshot wow. of wow. my career. And during that time, you're on your Christian journey. So uh, how, how have you uh, been inspired, or how has, um, have you created your models for leadership? Well, I always tried to, um, I didn't hide the fact that I was sort of believed in Christ. I was a Christian. I had a Bible on my desk always. Everybody knew that. But I didn't, of course, it was just as a symbol uh, for the people to understand where I came from. But I tried in all aspects of, of the company to be able to introduce, shall we say, principles, ethics. And, 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 and uh, for instance, uh, we kept our word. Whatever, whenever we gave our word, word of mouth, because in the States, traditionally, you know, you have to sign about, they have two lawyers helping you sign many papers. Um, and in many instances, uh, when we had given our word to someone or an institution or a bank, and then someone came along with a better offer. It was easy. Typically, what you do is, well, you have to go for what's best for your stockholders, and you go with a better offer. Well, I refused to do that. We always, when we said something, it was, it was our word, and we kept our word. And that's up. quite Middle Eastern as well. You know, it, in, it, you mentioned Egypt right. and other areas. Right. If someone gives their word, right. it, it, that's, that's correct. That I mean, transactions in the cotton business in Egypt at the time was all by word of mouth, and huge sums of money were transacted just by word of my mouth over the telephone. So you're absolutely correct about that. Yes, but uh, nevertheless, it's a principle that you yes. keep your word. And uh, we try to be equitable as far as compensation and the company's concerned. You know, there's always a tendency, um, unfortunately, of people, uh, you know, upper, ma upper echelon of management, wanting to, um, you know, tend to be greedy, shall we say. And, uh, and I tried to make sure that it is equitable distribution of wealth creation in the company to as many people as we could. So that was another element of that. And um, also, because we transacted business overseas and we started businesses and companies abroad, I think China and the Far East, we always were very upfront that we would not deal in any way underhandedly. In other words, we would not negotiate, we would not give any kickbacks. It was right up front before we sat at the table. We said, these are the rules I'm engaging. If you want to play by those rules, we'll continue, otherwise we'll go home. And very countercultural in those okay. days. And uh, it was, in, it was in, in China, it was in Russia, and many other parts, and Egypt, for instance. So, uh, of course, it cost us, because when you do that, then you may lose opportunities, but we refused to do that. So that was part, again, of, shall we say, the biblical principles of being transparent and honest about our dealings. So these are some, some examples of that. Um, the other one was we try to be a good citizen wherever we went. Uh, comes to mind Bulgaria. We, uh, we built uh, very large facilities over there. And 
in the, the, the town had, had a hospital which was not well <coughs> equipped. We added, uh, we added um, cardiac center over there, which they didn't have, which they appreciated. We added a hostel as well. And we also helped the school teach English because that will help the students. So we try to be a good citizen at the same time, and give, you know, give back to the lo local community. So that's in essence, if you will, how. And, and do you have um, specific, um, you had your Bible on your desk. Did you, you said that it was there as a symbol, but were you able to refer to some specific role models? Well, I tried whenever, you know, appropriate in the company, you know, you go around, talk to employees and talk to management, is uh, to use biblical uh, principles, but also biblical models, role models. And um, because of what we did, a lot of transformational stuff at the time, I used uh, one of my principles and the ones that I enjoyed reading and, and shall we say, to emulate is Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah was a great strategist. He prayed a lot. He was a prayerful man, but a great strategist and understood, shall we say, what is today called lean manufacturing. I mean, not spending a lot of money or effort to do something. And of course, case in point is that he um, built the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. Now, even if you try to do that today, it's a major feat. So I don't know how he did it then. But uh, it was an amazing feat, and he had a great mind. So he's, he's one of them. And also, he was also very mindful of the people who were underprivileged. He tried to convince it all his wealthy friends, and uh, at the time, to forgive loans that uh, they made to, to the poorer people in the, the, star, uh, in the, in the community. Uh, another person that I admire a great deal was Joseph because of his servanthood. He was a great servant. And I think his integrity and servant combined really al allowed him to rule Egypt. And in fact, to impose such a large tax during good times. Uh, and people accepted it because they trusted him. And so that was, and then of course, when the time came where the money had, to, the, the food had to be redistributed, they, they trusted him as to he would be equitable in the distribution. So it was another great role model. So I combined those two, and I always used to say that I'd, I'd like to have Joseph as chairman of the board and Nehemiah as chief executive. Very good, very good. And um, you're famous um, in the media f for having turned around. You didn't just take on a company, you know, and s turn on the engine and everything worked. You, you turned around American Standard. Well, it just happened that when I took over at the time when we had, the company had done a leveraged buyout because we were being attacked by Black & Decker trying to take us over. So we, we um, and, and the, the uh, bankers at the time made a sort of, you know, they do a forecast and say, okay, over the next three years, everything's going to be wonderful. Everything's going to go very well. But unfortunately, what happened, their forecast was totally wrong because we entered a recession. So our earnings that they banked on, which we needed to service our loans, were not there anymore. We started selling a lot of core, non-core assets, which helped us. They gone patched the, you know, gave us a bit of lease, a lease, a lease of time. However, uh, it was not enough. So the only area where we could look to to generate any cash to keep the banks at bay, keep the wolves at bay, is your suppliers. Was to was our working capital, yeah, and uh, and at the time our working capital, our, our inventory, was the main area of working capital, and we had about, as I recall, about half a billion dollars worth of, or six hundred million dollars worth of inventory, and I said, okay, well we need to do something, but we need to grab this thing. But it's easier said than done. We operated, we had a hundred and five or eight, I don't remember now, manufacturing facilities in thirty-four countries. So you had to do this collectively at the same time, otherwise it wouldn't have an impact. So we used this technique and indeed uh, we were able, we adopted this technique, we had to train 20,000 people worldwide, six languages, so they all comprehend what it is, and we monitored this on a weekly basis and we begin to generate, it was about two million dollars a week, which is a hundred million dollars a year, and kept and kept going, kept the, kept the company going, and, and we defended ourselves against the banks, and as we, we serviced our loans. 
So over a period of four years, we had reduced our, our inventory by half a billion dollars. And uh, that really set us back and we were able to go public again, if you will. But that was the, a major, major program, if you will. And, and in such a, what's effectively a revolutionary change, transformation of the company, um, how did you maintain the biblical principles? Because you, you've heard many stories of the, the sort of asset stripping or cash yes. and well, slash and burn That is a very approach. good question because um, what we implemented was, you know, I can say it virtually a miracle that we were able to do this in such a short time. I mean, the, the S&P uh, had to call us in and say, well, are you fiddling the books? Because they couldn't believe that we were generating cash when uh, sales were sort of virtually flat and very little income. So we said, where are you getting your money? <laughs> Printing it, maybe. But um, um, so what, we prom what I promised at the time, that all these actions of efficiency and everything else, we would never lay anybody off. So everybody had a job. And in fact, in anything, we used them to do other things. So we gave that promise, which we kept. And that helped us. I mean, that sort of, everybody was very supportive because you need, when you're doing something like that, you need everybody's 100% attention and effort on this thing. You can't, you can't be half-hearted. So the whole company, the whole, you know, all the employees were very much committed to this. And I think the, the environment that we're not, we're not abusing or using uh, this effort to reduce employment and reduce cost, that we wouldn't do that was a major, I think, element in the success of the company. I suppose one uh, sort of spiritual principle is don't waste um, resources or time. And so in manufacturing, time is absolutely critical. Absolutely, and you, you, you sort of remind me of a, of, a, of a time when in one of our factories, large factories in Germany, as a matter of fact, um, where the cycle time of production, we make taps, you know, four sets taps for the bathrooms. Um, it used to take about 22 days, 22, 24 days from foundry to finished goods. By transforming the company and using what you just said, where the principle is that typically in a sort of a, a normal manufacturing process, 90% of the time is non-added value activity and only 10% of the time is, is where performance, where action is taken and to, to transform the product. So you have that rule, 90-20. And we took that 24 days and brought it down to eight hours. So we were able to condense the manufacturing cycle from 24 days to eight hours, gave us competitive advantage, we can respond to the customer. But above all, we were able to limit the amount of working capital we needed, finished goods and, and, and of course inventory and, and, and supplies and raw materials. So we did that in every facility throughout the world, yeah. And uh, alongside that, were there other innovations apart from processes and management innovations? Uh, yes, uh, we took that principle of cycle time reduction, shortening cycle time, it being more responsive, we took it to the whole management structure. Because if you look at an organization, typical organizations are hierarchical. You know, you've got the hierarchies up here, functional heads, and they will go down. But when you look at work, work gets done horizontally. So we said, well, and I was uh, actually one of our mentors at the time was a gentleman by Dr. Hammer. He's dead, unfortunately, now. And Michael Hammer. And um, we worked with him, and he said, you could do this. So we flipped everything. Instead of having hierarchical management, we did process management. So we had people running processes with all the functions necessary to deliver that process, whether it's a product development process, uh, order fulfillment process, or whatever process it is, you had them done horizontally, and we made process owners. So in the process, you had all the functions necessary to deliver the process. And um, it paid off because it, it created, you had to act as a team, and, and it created a lot of teamwork, and we, we, we were able to reduce decision making in the organization but also being much more responsive to the customer, the whole thing sort of. So it combined very well with uh, what we did in the factory, where it's, you know, machines don't talk back to you, whereas people do. But we were able to uh, transform, and people were highly motivated because they were part of teams, and they could see the end product, whatever it was, delivery of the various processes. So it was you had this visibility, which also motivated people. And, uh, you know, you could set targets, aggressive targets, and went after them. 
so you went out on a, a sort of success story, a high. Um, uh, 1999, you, you, you finished 2000. with America, 2000, yes, I, and then I and retired in 2000. Okay, so. and then you didn't really retire because you started with your wife this yes. um, Kairos journal. Yes. Could you just uh, well, give you, an oversight on that? On the introduction, on the exactly. Introduction you said, well, so I, uh, the issue was that I I felt that leadership is very important in in any in every sector of society or, or life, and of course leadership in church and. Um, I felt that, the, the, you know, whereas in my world, church and pastors were totally irrelevant. I mean, they don't even, you know, you don't see them on the radar screen. I felt that the church is the most important institution on earth. And therefore, um, you know, I was always focused on seeing what is the church doing about issues. The church, typically, historically, always led in issues which affected the public square and otherwise, if you look through the history. So we said, well, we need to do something to help embolden and educate pastors who don't have the time. So we developed Kairos Journal as a research tool where we have you know, 40 topics which affect life and looked at from various perspectives, what the Bible teaches, history, uh, whose quotation writings of what happened today, to help pastors uh, understand and if they need go back and be educated and emboldened indeed if they look at the historical quadrant, yes. So that was one of our initiatives. And did you, you know, from running such a large operation, when you, when you, in retirement, looked at the church, did you, did you see sort of overlaps and, and principles that could be applied in, in how uh, churches are run? I think, I think the focus, but also the principle of being able to be transparent and speak the truth, whatever. I mean, we had, we had to speak the truth in the company. You had your regulations and the policies. Well, the policy of the church is the Bible, so you have to apply the Bible, the whole Bible, uh, uh, to, to, to everything that the church does. You can't be selective and say, well, I like this, I don't like this. So the total counsel of God, if you will. So I think that, that aspect is what I felt that, you know, would be helpful, and this is why we did KJ. We hopefully, we did that and demonstrated through the writings uh, that this is historically what happened in the churches and the church leaders. So we just hope that today's church would emulate that. And unfortunately, when you don't, you have the results as we see today in areas like gay marriage or other areas which come to light because the church, I don't think, has played its part to educate its constituents. And, and is it um, only people who are in a church ministry who you're addressing? Excuse my ignorance on the journal, <laughs> no, but um, no, no, I mean the, also the people generally in life. Well, Keros Journal was done for church leadership and people who, who preach and the like. Uh, we did Bible Mesh was the other initiative sub after that is to, because of the high level of biblical illiteracy that exists, which I've, I've has the, its effect. I mean, that's again the issue. If you are biblically literate, you will you cannot understand what the whole counsel of God is, what you should be doing. This is why we have the problems we have today. So, we decided to do Bible Match, which is really a, a New Testament, Old Testament survey of of the Bible to make it attractive, you know, on the net. And um, and uh, so we we felt that this would be accessible to a lot of people, particularly today that everybody uses the net, the net, you know, the internet for that. And that's why we, we embarked on that. And it's also, in fact, a, lot of, a couple of colleges in the States are giving it credits. So if you do it correctly, you can get university credits for that. Excellent. And then you just mentioned the internet and you've also set up BibleMesh.com. Could you expand on that? Well, BibleMesh.com is how we did this, this, uh, this survey, the biblical survey, but also we added biblical languages, which is a recent addition. In fact, it was launched recently. Again, here is that it, you cannot afford to lose the languages in which the scriptures are written. It's found foundational. And I think we, 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 ha we heard this uh, today and, and, and in, you know, that, that without the biblical Hebrew and Greek, I mean, and if you don't know that, it's very difficult to understand, fully understand and comprehend the Bible. Not that everybody has to do it, but at least members of the church and church leaders should be familiar with the languages. And unfortunately, a lot of the more liberal uh, theological colleges are abandoning the languages. And that is, I think, is, is, could be very detrimental to the faith. 
So, um, BibleMesh.com, people would go onto that website and h how, how would you convey the biblical language through that? Well, we have two, BibleMesh.com has two elements to it. it. has the biblical story, which has the survey, the Old, Old Testament, New Testament survey. And it's done through seven years. It's, it's um, narrated. It's actually the teachings done by Tim Keller. Presbyterian Church in New York, and we have it's a sort of a, a, a we got a it's a documentary type. It's got animation, so that be able to make it attractive for people to look at. And you've got uh, uh, many articles that d describe each era, and they talk about the background of the era, political background, who the key players are, what the theology is. Who the uh, what the key events are of each era. So we've broken the Bible in seven eras, and each one has articles of that. You've got this presentation, and and you can be tested and so forth. So it's a complete it's a complete course, if you will. It's a 30, 36 week course if you do it diligently. If you can want to skip around, you can do that. Now that's the biblical story. On the other hand, biblical languages is um, is we've got a whole. It's a, a very large course, it's in four levels. Each level is about 160, 160 hours of work that you have to go through. So you go through that and it's the inductive method. We try to make it attractive because, you know, learning Hebrew or Greek is not an easy task and people sort of, their eyes glaze over when they start reading grammar in particular. So we try to make it attractive so we, we get people to get into the text right away and then you have all the supporting elements, if you will, of grammar uh, and dictionary and the like, and of course teaching, because you've got the, t the professor there teaching you at the same time. So what, what would your advice be to young um, Christians today who uh, you know, aspire to, uh, to ministry, but also aspire to having influence in industry and out in the commercial world? Is, is there a way that someone could, you know, emulate what you've achieved, which is both well, that's an interesting question. It's a difficult question. It's not on the list. <laughs> it's not on the list. Um, I think that, yes, I think you have to do whatever your God has given you, whatever talent God has given you, and you've got to exercise the talent. And if the talent can enable you to generate money or wealth, you should do so, obviously abiding by biblical principles, but it doesn't mean that you should not also focus on what God has given you and promote you know, you, you know, promote Christian ministry in whatever field you want. I mean, you could either support ministries financially or do, have your own ministries or do whatever. But I think you have to start with what God has given you. If God has given you a talent to be a musician, then be the best musician. But at the same time, while you're playing your music and you're attracting people and making money, you also have to promote the gospel and God's word. And, and, and so not be ashamed and be front and center about that. I think the important thing is not to be afraid to say that you're a Christian. And that's, to me, uh, one of the aspects of whatever success you may have in whatever area, you, it, you should not hide your, your Christian faith. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mane. And thank you for your testimony of, of your life. Delighted. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you also to our audience here and to uh, you, the uh, viewing audience, and also to the organizers of this wonderful conference, the European Leadership Forum Annual Conference. Uh, you can uh, see some of the answers to these questions on the new website, which is focalonline.org, www.focl.online.org. Goodbye.